Welcome everyone to this market structure update. My name is David Easthoe. I'm the head of FinTech at Greenwich's Market Structure and Technology Practice, and I'm joined by my colleague Shane Swanson, head of our equities practice. And we'd like just to jump right in and say, why are we talking today? And the reason we are talking today is that the SEC has put forth a rule proposal to change the definition of what it means to be an exchange. And we are here today to discuss why the definition of an exchange is so important under US rules and why this change could be so impactful. And Shane, as we were discussing earlier, the proposal never mentions crypto or digital assets, but you said something that caught my attention is that you believe this is a shot across the bow of crypto, digital asset firms, and DeFi ecosystems in general. So you certainly got my attention. And so with that backdrop and background, Perhaps you want to just talk us through what exactly yes, has the SEC done and how have they changed the rules and what does the proposal look like to you? Sure, and thanks, David, and welcome, everybody. First of all, I, you almost have to start with the grounding of what are the rules today, right? What are the definitions that we work under? And the base definitions are what are what is a security? And it's interesting because in the proposal and the reason I made the statement I did to you about crypto is that the SEC highlights what is a security, and it includes, I'm going to read this out because I couldn't do it otherwise, government securities, corporate bonds, municipal securities, NMS stocks, equity securities that are not NMS stocks, private restricted securities, repurchase agreements, and reverse repurchase agreements, foreign sovereign debt, and options. And importantly, and they highlight this more than once, it does not exempt novel or thinly traded securities. And the reason, again, that's so important is the environment we live in today where crypto is a novel asset class uh, and digital assets are popping up on almost daily basis and new ways of transacting business are occurring. The fact that the SEC emphasizes that as the state of the law today and that they have uh, jurisdiction over securities trading is very important. So that's the basic uh, definition that we live with. Then why does that matter? Well, if you are an entity, an organization, a group of uh, persons that are trading, if you are bringing together, as the definition of an exchange puts it, orders for securities of multiple buyers and sellers, so orders being firm orders, as we understand that in the industry, and you use established non-discretionary methods to let those orders interact. You are an exchange. Uh, you have been deemed an exchange under the US rules. And if you uh, act in that manner and fail to register as an exchange, the full weight of the SEC can then fall upon you. Uh, you know, in some ways, almost every word of that definition is important and has been argued over over many years. What is, a, what is an order? What is an established non-discretionary method? And now uh, the SEC has decided that they want to vastly expand what an exchange is. And that's why we're here today. Um, and I can jump right into that or we can talk about the why of where and how we got here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it strikes me that it is broad. It encompasses a wide range of assets. So. You know, what do you think about this sort of vast expansion, right? This, this, what are the implications for firms that are sort of keeping an eye on this? And what are some of the things that they need to look at and, and make their own determination, do you think? Sure. Well, yeah, I, again, I think it's important. So we start from where we were and where are we going, right? So what is the expansion? The expansion is now we're not just thinking it, of it in terms of firm orders that are, that are in scope of what is traded. Now we're using this phrase trading interest. So the SEC has put that out as if you are uh, using a system that has a trading interest, so firm orders and non-firm orders. And if you are doing that through what they uh, call a communication protocol system, which is not defined in 654 pages of their proposal, but which is basically a system that um, brings together, again, a buyer and a seller and allows them to negotiate a price, a security, and to put together a trade, not even necessarily on their own system, but anywhere. If they are, allow, if they are allowing themselves to bring that together, that 
somewhat amorphous concept can now be considered a trade, uh, considered an exchange. And the reason that the SEC did this was really we have to kind of you know roll back the clock a little bit. And back in September of 2020, they put forth a proposal around governmental securities. And so really, this started because there is a tremendous amount of trading in the fixed income market, which occurs through RFQ platforms, request for quote, through streaming access, through tr- non-traditional methods, and you know, made a lot of sense in the fixed income space to do trading in that manner. The SEC became somewhat concerned that there was so much trading that occurred away from more traditional methods that they didn't have a regulatory home for, or that there might even be regulatory arbitrage to be able to trade away from a regulated uh, environment that some people were put at a a disadvantage. So they proposed Reg ATS-G in September of 2020, which had some of these concepts that RFQ would be brought into scope, that IOIs might be brought into scope. So this non-firm concept was kicked around, but very focused on the fixed income market. That comment period went out. There was a lot of comment that went in and that kind of went into the regulatory black hole that happens many times. And we jump forward to today and this, again, much different proposal, which encompasses all securities, again, to the definition above, uh, and any trading interest in any of those securities can now bring you into the definition of an exchange on any of these systems. So RFQs, IOIs, streaming access, negotiating systems, any system that brings buyers and sellers together in non-firm ways, even if they're not trading on your own system, can now be considered an exchange if you've put together a securities name or an identification of a security, say by QCIP, uh, a price, a size, or a quantity, that is enough to bring you into the definition of this communication protocol system. Yeah, I can see how that focuses directly into that fixed income RFQ world. We know that that crypto trading, there's a lot of RFQ. There are a lot of uh, systems which are trying to aggregate markets or create liquidity for, for clients. But before we kind of jump into the implications for them, you know, who who actually do you think is going to meet this this technical definition? I mean, how how can firms maybe think about navigating this world or or even avoiding some of this? Like what's what's going to be the pathway for them? Uh, well, that that's the that's the million dollar question, right? And quite honestly, it might be a million dollar question when you have to decide which path you go down if you're going to have to register or not. Um, and that is not a hundred percent clear, right? What we think of today is. You know, if you are, um, you know, a technology system and you are putting out these type of, you know, non-firm orders, if you are identifying a security, again, to that broad scope of what might be a security, you're identifying the security, you've got a price, size, or quantity on that security, and anyone else can then, you know, communicate with that message to place a trade even away from your system you're in scope as written today. So, you know, my world according to Shane, and I will say there is a statement in the proposal kind of buried about midway through where the SEC has to do its analysis of what are the potential costs to the industry, where they say there's only about 22 systems they've identified that would be communication protocol systems. I'll be blunt, I think that is vastly underrated because you can't, and I think that's partially based on their analysis they did in September of 2020 around the fixed income space, which was a little more limited in scope. If you now open it up to the entire world of digital assets and everything else that's out there, you know, the funnel is very wide. And unless and until the industry and all the commenters come in and help narrow that that funnel in somewhat, I think that number is going to be very, very significant. And again, it will end up being a matter of who draws the attention of the regulators, you know, by virtue of size practice or, you know, bad behavior and therefore get the hammer brought down. You know, if you're a tiny little player somewhere and you're doing three trades a day, you may never get, get, you know, that regulatory scrutiny. 
you're doing serious amounts of business and have a lot of order flow that is, you know, handled through your systems, you will have regulatory scrutiny knocking on your door if this is passed. And I guess, sorry, go ahead, please. Yeah, I can see, I can see that. And it, it just feels like such for the way things have operated. I, I understand the fixed income RFQ part of the equation, but for the way things have operated in crypto now for so long, it feels like a major departure, right? It feels like a major inflection point potentially of bringing more and more systems into that technical definition of an exchange. Uh, we know there are a lot of ATSs out there already uh, that are focused on on digital assets. You know, is that what are some of the the ways that firms can either avoid being an exchange, you know, maybe register an ATS or a broker dealer? Like, what are, what are some specific things that you think firms can and should do uh, in terms of you know looking at this and deciding maybe they are in they are in scope? So, what do they need to do? Certainly. Well, again, I think today, if you feel you are trading a security, <laughs> right, and you are uh, technically, you technically meet the definition of an exchange. The, there's a fork, right? You either file a form one and register as a national securities exchange with the SEC and have the full rules and processes that go along with that. That is a major endeavor. It's not uh, as impossible as it was historically. It used to be almost impossible. Now we've got 17 U.S. equity exchanges, 16 U.S. options exchanges. You know, the the pathway is clear. It's not simple. It's not necessarily cheap, but it is something that can be done. So if you want to become a national securities exchange, you know, you, there is a well laid out methodology to do so. However, it is a high regulatory burden. Much, much more likely firms will decide to be, use the exemption from being an exchange, which is to file as an alternative trading system or an ATS. The ATS filing is you have to then file the you have to file a form BD with the SEC, which means you have to become a broker dealer. You have to register with a designated examining authority for ATSs, that's FINRA, almost 100%. You then, as an ATS and a member of FINRA, you know, you'll be subject to investor protection rules. You'll have examination and market surveillance rules. You'll, if you are trading a asset class that has them, you'll have trade reporting rules. Um, with a with a ATS filing, you'll have to have written procedures around handling confidential information of your subscribers. You may have to consider fair access requirements if you trip over the fair access, um, the, the uh, percentages of the asset you're trading. Uh, you'll need to decide which type of form ATS you have to file. If you are a non-NMS and under the new proposal, certain government securities, uh, you will file just a regular form ATS. Uh, it's a not simple file to form, but form to file. Uh, but you have to file it 20 days before you begin operations. Just file, and it's kind of a notice filing with the SEC once you've got your broker dealer set up and running. If you are trading NMS stocks or under the new proposal of government securities, you have to file a form ATS N. A fairly involved filing, and it you cannot become operational until the SEC declares that form effective. Uh, it's not the same level of scrutiny that an exchange filing gets or a rule filing gets, but it is kind of the next level down below that. So it is something that the SEC will go back and forth with filers on. If they don't think you have been fully um, transparent or fully developed your answers to their questions on the form ATS-N, you will be told it won't become effective and you are not allowed to become operational until that is declared effective. So that's a, you know, a, an issue. And I will say for current, say, uh, digital asset um, firms out there that may be operating in what is an exchange-like fashion, if you're operating in the U.S. and you are operating like an exchange or an ATS, uh, one of the rules for being an ATS in the U.S., you can't have the word exchange or stock market in your name because you're only allowed to do that if you are a national securities exchange under a form one. Uh, otherwise, it, the SEC believes that could cause confusion. So just something to be aware of. No, that's really interesting. Yeah, it, it does seem like a a complicated path if you decide to, to pursue full registration. Uh, there seem to be 
plausible scenarios where firms would would seek that ATS license or even acquire a business or figure out a way to, to partner with an ATS. I, I could see that potentially uh, becoming a, a popular approach. But let's let's get into the weeds a little bit on like where the lines are between you know, an ATS and something that's more like a just a basic RFQ system and that where is that line chain so in, in terms of you know you mentioned yeah. interest right trading interest not just orders but a lot of these rfq flat platforms or platforms in crypto they combine streaming prices from dealers w with uh with exchange prices on these quote exchanges like where where is that line go going to be do you think is there going to be some pushback perhaps on on where that line is drawn as this process plays out and comment letters are written, et cetera? Yeah, I think what we'll likely end up finding. So I think an important point to make uh, that as part of this filing that the SEC has reiterated, there are common exemptions uh, from what is considered to be an exchange and that are, you know, they fall into, you know, what are the standard practices of broker dealers when they use their discretion as broker dealer? So uh, routing to a national securities exchange, routing to another broker dealer for execution, uh, single dealer platforms that only expose the orders that they have to one party. So those are all kind of common exemptions from an exchange uh, requirement. You don't have to be an ATS, you're not an exchange. So that's one path. If you're a broker dealer and you're doing common accepted practices of a broker dealer, that might be a, a, a venue to go down. Uh, the, you know, the other path would be you're not putting together buyers and sellers. You're not using, you know, creating interest, although that's going to be hard in many of these platforms that are currently existing because, you know, face it, if you're using an RFQ, it's a request for quote. Somebody is saying, hey, yeah, I'm really interested. And somebody else says, so am I. And they get together and you, they are directed toward a, you know, another platform to trade. That's kind of squarely in this definition and I think it's going to be really challenging to, you know, navigate your way out of that through some fancy footwork because the SEC has also said they're going to try to broadly get their arms around this. Part of the rationale we should probably go into is that back way back in 1998, the SEC put out the Reg ATS exemption, right? So before that, there really weren't official ATSs. There were certainly dark pools and platforms that existed, but they didn't really fall into this. Um, kind of bifurcated path of your exchange or your ATS. And even in that original filing, there was discussion around in indications of interest, right? Those were something that were already being used. There was concern that firms would, well, I'm going to send you an IOI, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, but really it's a firm order, but we'll call it an IOI because we really don't want to get into all this hubbubaloo around being an ATS or it being a firm order or having order reporting or firm quote uh, obligations. So the SEC highlighted that as a potential issue, hasn't really, I don't believe, followed up or hit anyone for failure to, you know, um, or for, for having had firm orders as IOIs. But in this proposal says, you know, there are clearly circumstances where firms are using non-firm nomenclature with firm order, um, you know, uh, type of behavior. So they are trying to close what they consider to be that loophole and will interpret things broadly to make sure that loophole is firmly closed. In that, you know, in that worldview, if you're trying to navigate around that by, you know, carefully classifying, oh, I don't have an RFQ, it's it's a message I'm sending to a somebody else, not even a counterparty. It's just, you know, friends, it's a message to a friend but it has a security with a price on it and the other friend has a security with a price on it and they meet and they have a handshake and that handshake ends up trading on a exchange. Nobody's fooled. It's going to be an ATS or an exchange and you're going to, you know, that's going to be in, in scope. I think the biggest pushback will likely be for um, systems like EMSs, uh, execution management systems that have RFQs, have IOIs, are kind of in that, well, if I'm not being managed by a broker dealer, if I'm just a technology system, I kind of feel like maybe that falls into this communication protocol world, but I don't really feel like it was necessarily intended to be. 
you know, maybe it was, maybe the SEC will say, absolutely, 100%, we're not going to let you have any wiggle room here. Maybe not. But that would be where I'll expect to start to see some comment letters and some pushback. And that's where it's important for, again, as always, the audience to make sure their voice gets heard. You know, we spend a lot of time collectively in our group reading comment letters uh, because it tells you kind of which way the winds are blowing and what are the hot button issues, at least as seen by the people who are putting forth their voice. But if you don't put your voice out there, you know, you may have a very unique view that the SEC hasn't considered, and they do read all the comment letters. So it's really important to make sure that as, you know, all the all practitioners out there and people who are interested in this space, if you're reading through that, you know, 654 pages or whatever synopsis you want to, and you feel you have a differing view, let the SEC know, and it's fairly easy to comment. I, I'll just put in my, uh, you know, my special, you know, Shane Swanson caveat, Please don't use the form letter. Uh, the SEC gets a lot of them. They read the first one, and then they just tally them. And they really don't put a whole lot of weight behind them because it's a form letter, and form letters don't really mean all that much. If you really care about the issue, take the time to write it in your own words, and that will mean a whole lot more than if you just cut and paste something into a Word doc and forward it over to the SEC. Wow, this is really interesting. I I think what resonates to me is that there's some some systems that likely believe, yeah, they're very much in scope and they're the intended audience and bringing it into this, the fold. And there's these other firms you mentioned, EMSs, that feel like they're not the intended audience potentially, but they could fall into it. So those firms need to be really engaged, really hyper focused on what's happening. And, and you've laid out kind of a number of, of steps, ways that they can stay formed and plan ahead. And hopefully we've also done some some work here to 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 illuminate yeah. this, this topic, which to me, uh, I've noticed is talking to crypto firms hasn't really landed in the space yet. I'll think the the some of the firms that call themselves exchanges right now are, are have big legal teams and are ready to go. But other firms uh, you mentioned EMSs or or other trading systems probably haven't haven't reached them yet. So, uh, Shane, you did a really good job kind of laying this all out. And uh, any final words for other ways firms should should stay on top of this uh, the subject matter? Yeah, I mean, I think as always, we're big believers in you know industry groups. It's sometimes hard, in particular, smaller groups, smaller firms to know everything. Right? It's really almost impossible. So, it, you know, join an industry group. Pay attention to what they put out. There's lots of material on the web. Pay attention to those things as they go out. Like I said, go to the SEC website and see what other people are saying. That might kick off a thought on your own. Um, you know, watch watch sessions like this. We try to do our best, and we'll try to do more in the future. But uh, that's it's really incumbent on everybody to be informed and then to you know get their own voice heard so that we can help the SEC do the, their job, which is to listen to the market and then put the best rule forth that they possibly can. Great. Thanks, Shane, and thanks, everyone, for joining. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Bye-bye.